Hello, young soul. Welcome to the Daily Horror Channel. If you are afraid of real and scary reports, this channel is not for you. I suggest you leave this video. But if you are not afraid of listening to these horrifying reports, I suggest you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next stories. The first time I heard about the tunnel, it felt like a local legend. One of those stories shared among friends to scare the uninitiated. Lucas and Joano insisted it was nonsense, but Felipe, the eldest in the group, swore something was off. They said it was an old tunnel, nearly forgotten, lost at the city's outskirts, where few dared to pass after dark. Whenever someone crosses at night, something follows them, he murmured softly, making everyone laugh. But I noticed a serious tone in his voice, and somehow, that story stuck in my mind. It was a Friday. The plan was just for a walk, an excuse to shake off boredom and explore the area before vacation ended. And we decided, in a mix of bravery and provocation. It's just a tunnel, Lucas laughed, as if we were overreacting. It was late afternoon, and the sky was beginning to turn dark. Even from afar, as we arrived at the entrance, a feeling of unease overwhelmed me. The tunnel's opening looked like a dark mouth. The silence there was oppressive broken only by the echoes of our footsteps on the damp walls. The ground was uneven with wet stones, reflecting Felipe's lantern's faint glow. With each step we took, the temperature seemed to drop, as if the very air was avoiding entering the tunnel. I tried to ignore the sudden chill, but I couldn't help glancing back, though nothing but darkness stretched along the path we'd come from. As we moved forward, the first murmurs began. At first, it was just the sound of the wind brushing through the narrow walls. But I quickly realized the voices sounded more intense, weak whispers blending with our steps. They seemed like words, words we couldn't comprehend. Felipe, at the front, suddenly stopped, and his lantern flickered, almost as if something invisible had touched it. He murmured something about hearing laughter, but Lucas ignored him, laughing, calling him scared. Then, out of nowhere, the lantern went out. We were enveloped in such thick darkness that it was impossible to see an inch in front of our faces. The tunnel felt like it was swallowing us, and in that absolute silence, the sound of whispers grew louder. My breath caught in my chest when I felt something brush past me. I saw nothing, but it was as if a cold presence grazed my skin, as real as a breeze. In a panic, Lucas managed to turn on his cell phone's flashlight but the light seemed almost powerless against the surrounding darkness. That's when I noticed something peculiar. The tunnel seemed longer, almost endless, as if we had walked much further than expected. Let's go back, I whispered. But when I looked behind, I realized the entrance, our way out to the world outside, had vanished from sight, replaced by an even more oppressive darkness. My heart was racing. Felipe, who had been quiet until then, confessed in a low voice, almost a lament, that he felt something was watching us. With each step, the sound of a slow, dragging breath seemed to draw closer. We started walking faster, the sound of our footsteps echoing through the tunnel, mixed with what now sounded like extra footsteps, slow, almost unhurried. Juano, who was further back, suddenly stopped. He was staring fixedly at a wall, eyes wide open. As we turned to see what he was looking at, we saw shadows dancing, faceless shapes contorting on the wall, like reflections of people who had never been there. Did you see that? I whispered, but no one responded. They were all staring, hypnotized. The shadows began to form a clear figure, which slowly turned to face us. The expression on its face, though indistinct, was like a silent scream, a mouth open without sound. Then, in the blink of an eye, Lucas's lantern flickered. We were plunged back into darkness, but now the sound was closer, as if the figures we had seen before had finally caught up with us. Panic took over, and we started to run, each trying to remember the path back. Amid the chaos, I heard the sound of a distorted, low laugh, echoing from every direction. 
We were lost, and the exit seemed to never reveal itself. Until suddenly, a flash illuminated the tunnel ahead of us. A familiar figure stood there, motionless. It was Felipe. He had a vacant expression, his eyes fixed on us as if he had never known us. The tunnel never lets you leave, he said in a monotone voice, as his form slowly faded into the darkness. I don't remember how we got out of there, but when we found ourselves back at the entrance, the air felt strangely still. Felipe was not among us, and the tunnel behind seemed like a silent mouth, sealed in mystery. On the way home, the silence between us was thick, as dense as the darkness of the tunnel we had just left. No one seemed willing to break the silence, but something hung in the air, as if each of us was trapped in our own disturbing thoughts. Lucas, who usually never shut up, was now staring intensely at the ground, and Joao had a slight tremor in his hands, trying unsuccessfully to mask his nervousness. That's when I realized we were walking in circles. Wait, haven't we passed this way before? I asked, interrupting the silence. Lucas looked around, frowning. I don't think so, man. He tried to sound confident, but the hesitation was clear. This doesn't make sense, Joao whispered. The tunnel entrance was right there, but it wasn't. Just the winding path ahead, disappearing into the mist, as if we were being forced to follow a route that led nowhere. The trees around seemed to close and slowly, getting closer, and the darkness intensified the mysterious and oppressive atmosphere surrounding us. After what felt like an eternity, we finally spotted the way back to the city. But when I looked back, I saw something that made my heart skip a beat. A motionless silhouette, eyes fixed on us, stood at the tunnel's entrance. It was tall, with a strangely familiar presence. My heart began to race, a primitive panic overtaking me. The figure looked like a twisted reflection of Felipe. What was that? Or rather, who? Let's get out of here, now, I said urgently, trying to push that disturbing image from my mind. The others seemed to sense my distress and without question quickened their pace. The figure didn't move, but its eyes, as dark and empty as the tunnel itself, seemed to follow us as we retreated. When we got home, the feeling of relief was instant, but something felt deeply wrong. I could still feel the presence of that figure, as if it had marked me, and every corner of the house seemed to cast larger shadows than I remembered. When I went to my room, the silence was uncomfortable, and then... I heard it, a faint whisper, weak but unmistakable. The tunnel never lets you leave. Mani? The sound came from somewhere nearby, almost as if someone were there, beside me, repeating Felipe's words from inside the tunnel. I stared at the mirror in the corner of the room, and for a brief second, I thought I saw something move behind me. When I turned, there was nothing. Just the emptiness of a dark room, and the sensation that something, or someone, was still there. The following nights were worse. Every time I closed my eyes, I dreamed of the tunnel, the oppressive darkness, the incessant whispers, and Felipe. Always waiting, with that vacant stare, I tried to ignore it, convincing myself it was just the echo of a traumatic experience, but the feeling lingered. On the third day, the situation became unbearable. Lucas and Joao were also avoiding any contact, and it seemed we all shared a secret that no one dared to speak of. Finally, Lucas called me, breaking the silence. Dude, are you also? He hesitated, his voice tense, having dreams about the tunnel. My stomach dropped, and I confirmed. He took a deep breath on the other end of the line. Something's wrong. I don't know what it is, but... I feel like we're being followed. Nobi, Kantoya, Asabdiadzes. He suggested we go to the tunnel again, one last time, to try to understand what happened. The plan sounded insane, but curiosity and fear of what continued haunting us were stronger than our reason. The next night, we gathered at the tunnel's entrance. The darkness felt thicker than ever, and the cold was biting. As we entered, I noticed the tunnel seemed different. The echoes of our footsteps sounded wrong, as if something was walking alongside us, hidden in the shadows. 
waiting for the right moment to reveal itself. Suddenly, Lucas stopped, his eyes wide. Are you seeing this? He pointed at the wall, where shadows danced, forming grotesque figures, almost human. It was as if the darkness itself was trying to materialize. We felt a cold wind blowing through the tunnel, and suddenly, a familiar voice echoed around us. It was Felipe. The tunnel never lets you leave. In the tunnel, Felipe's voice seemed to swirl around us, reverberating between the walls like a supernatural echo. We glanced at each other, every one of us reflecting the panic in each other's eyes, as if we feared that speaking might also summon whatever was there with us. I... Oh, I think he really is here, murmured Lucas, his voice barely audible. As if just the act of speaking could invoke something. In the silence that followed, the air grew heavy, and a palpable presence began to materialize around us. It felt closer, more intense, as if we were plunging into a living darkness, something ancient and malevolent awakened by our entry into that place. Suddenly, the lantern flickered and went out. A silent panic took over us. The cold became unbearable, and I felt something brush against my hand. A rough, icy texture that made my heart race. But before I could scream, the lantern turned back on, revealing nothing. We need to get out of here now, said Joao, trying to hide the fear in his voice. We began to retreat, trying to find the exit. But the darkness seemed to push us deeper, as if the tunnel stretched infinitely. But we were trapped in an endless maze, with each step pulling us further into darkness. And then, in the absolute silence, we heard it. Footsteps. Footsteps that weren't ours, but matched our pace, following our movements. The tunnel began to echo with a slow, deep breath. Almost like a macabre melody filling every corner. The figure of Felipe appeared again, this time clearer, standing right in front of us, with a vacant stare and an expression mixing rage and recognition. You shouldn't have come back, he whispered without moving his lips, but the sound of his voice seemed to come from within our own minds. Felipe, knew me weren't thou. Is that you? I asked, trying to stay calm, though my voice trembled. He didn't answer, just stared at us with an accusatory gaze, as if he knew we were trying to escape. His hand began to reach towards us, and the air around us became unbearably thick, making it hard to breathe. It was the tunnel, wasn't it? murmured Lucas, as if finally piecing something together. It never wanted us to leave. Not after what we saw. Felipe didn't respond, but his face twisted in pain. And for a moment, his human look returned, as if he was fighting against something invisible. He seemed to want to say something, but the words wouldn't come. Only a choked sound, as if he was being silenced. You need to. Need to. He started. But his voice faded. In an instant, Felipe dissolved into shadows, being pulled into the darkness that surrounded us. We stood frozen, and then we heard a low, distorted laugh, something that sounded like the tunnel itself mocking us. The entrance was there, so close, and yet impossible to reach, as if an invisible force kept us inside, condemned to never escape. Suddenly, the walls began to move, closing in on us, forcing us to retreat. It was as if the tunnel itself was alive, reshaping around us to swallow us whole. The whispers grew louder, incomprehensible words, but filled with hate and despair. Quick! shouted Joao, trying to pull us forward. But something invisible was holding our legs, making every step impossible. In the distance, one last image appeared before the lantern dimmed completely. It was Felipe, stretching out his hand, with a pleading look as if trying to save us from the same darkness that had captured him. The lantern went out again, and all that was left was a haunting silence.
That dark and silent night, Eduardo felt the crushing weight of the unknown around him. The walls of the room seemed closer, as if the space compressed around him, suffocating him with a sense of cold emptiness. The clock hands in the hallway, still frozen at 3.15, pulsed in his mind like an inevitable omen. A constant reminder that time was, somehow, out of his control. He knew something terrible was about to happen, yet he couldn't move, as if his body was held captive by an invisible force. Sitting on the bed, Eduardo tried to catch his breath, but a figure beside him, motionless and silent, watched him with a vacant, penetrating gaze. It was the same woman, her white dress pooling at her feet, her shadowy eyes fixed on him, and her skin almost translucent in the dim light filtering through the room. For a moment, he attempted to look away, but her presence seemed to engulf him completely, sucking away any trace of resistance. Ugh. Who are you? Eduardo managed to whisper, his voice barely escaping his dry throat. The woman merely stared, and then, slowly, she raised her pale arm, extending it toward him. He felt a wave of cold wash over him as her fingers brushed his wrist. He looked down, watching her marble-like fingers press precisely where he felt his heart pulse. It was as if she was feeling Eduardo's very lifeblood, assessing what was left. Your time is running out. She whispered in a tone that felt otherworldly. Eduardo swallowed hard, his heart racing erratically. It was as if her words wrapped around him, echoing within, reverberating in every corner of his mind. In a burst of despair, he jerked his arm away, breaking free from her icy touch, and stumbled back, gasping for breath. What do you want from me? He shouted, unable to disguise the terror in his voice. Her eyes seemed to glow with disturbing intensity. And without breaking her gaze, she murmured, You ignored the warning. Now, I need you. And they stopped grinned. Her words resonated in the room like an irrevocable sentence. Eduardo felt despair consume him, yet he could not escape her fixed. Deep down, he knew fleeing would not suffice. Something marked him, something he didn't understand, yet seemed inevitable and cruel. He tried to rise. But his legs wouldn't obey. His body was paralyzed, as if something else held the reins. The woman stepped closer, and Eduardo felt the air grow thin, dense, and heavy, as if the very room was sinking into an abyss of darkness, desperate to regain control. He closed his eyes, trying to concentrate, hoping that when he opened them, it would all be just a nightmare. But when he opened his eyes, he realized he was in another place. The room had vanished. He stood on a deserted road, shrouded in thick fog, and around him, there was an absolute silence. Eduardo tried to speak, but no sound emerged from his lips. He looked about, confused and disoriented, until he spotted the same woman in the middle of the road, closer than ever, her figure standing out in the darkness like a specter, an entity he could never understand. She raised her hand again, pointing to an old pocket watch she held delicately. The face read 3.15, and time seemed frozen at that instant. Everything you ignored, all the chances to step away, now belong to the past, she stated, her voice echoing in Eduardo's mind like a spell. I... I didn't want this. I don't understand. Eduardo shouted, but deep down, he knew something lay beyond his comprehension. It was as if she was the reflection of a warped time, of something he had neglected, or perhaps a choice he had made unconsciously. The woman, with a cold smile, moved closer still, and Eduardo felt that the nearer she got, the more the environment around him faded, as if he was being drawn into a dimension beyond the physical world. You ignored the rules of time, she whispered, and now time ignores you. My... Suddenly, Eduardo felt an immense weight crash down on his shoulders, a fatigue that seemed to come from ages, as if he carried the entire burden of a lifetime of regrets and neglected choices. Every second stretched into an eternity, and he knew, in that moment, that his existence was being devoured, as if his very time was being extracted, sucked away to feed something he could never comprehend. The woman continued to stare at him, 
her face expressionless, yet her penetrating eyes watched him with an inhuman intensity. Eduardo tried to move, but he had no strength left. Every part of his being seemed to dissolve, and the last thing he saw before being completely engulfed in darkness was the watch. Unyieldingly set at 3.15, silence settled in, and Eduardo vanished, leaving behind only the echo of his last scream and an old pocket watch. Now, abandoned on the deserted road, frozen at the same hour. The next morning, Eduardo awoke with his body heavy, as if he had run a marathon. The room was steeped in a suffocating twilight, even with the sun high outside. The discomfort he felt during the night still lingered in his mind, like a remnant of something he couldn't erase. He sat up in bed, trying to gather his thoughts. But the memory of the woman in the white dress, her pale face, and the words that sounded like a verdict, refused to leave him. He got up and walked to the living room, but as he passed the wall clock, his stomach churned. The hands were stuck at 3.15. Eduardo tried to brush off the unease, hurrying away, but the air felt heavy, almost palpable, as if an invisible shadow was following closely behind. He picked up his phone, but the screen displayed the same time, frozen. Suddenly, the phone shut off, and when he tried to turn it back on, the display flickered repeatedly at 3.15 before shutting down entirely. Taking a deep breath, Eduardo decided to leave the house and forget what felt like a series of bewildering events. It was all a delusion, he told himself. Maybe accumulated fatigue made his mind conjure up stories. But as he walked through the streets, a strange sense of unease grew in his chest. The clocks in the shops he passed, the electronic billboards at the corners, even the displays of strangers' devices, all seemed to be marked by that same hour, the one now echoing in his mind. Finally, he mustered the courage to seek help. He headed to the antique shop where his old friend worked, the same one who had talked to him about spirits and dark omens. When he opened the shop door, a chill ran down his spine, as if an unseen shadow had followed him there. You're back quickly, Eduardo, said the antiquarian, his voice tinged with unsettling calm. The man's eyes appeared deeper than Eduardo remembered, as if they knew more than they should. You're still being called, aren't you? I don't know what's happening. Eduardo replied, his voice low and shaky. Sh that woman. She appeared again. And now everything around me feels stuck at 3.15. Miss again. The antiquarian leaned in closer, his face illuminated by the dim lamp's pale glow. When someone's time is called, the spirit does not rest until the person understands their fate. He paused and in a whisper, added, Do you remember something you left unfinished, Eduardo? A mistake. A warning you ignored. Eduardo felt the weight of the question, and as he struggled to remember something specific, a vague memory surfaced, a winding road at night, an accident from which he had emerged unscathed years ago. He recalled the sense of anguish, and the feeling that something had been following him since that day. A shadow that never fully abandoned him. I escaped from something, Eduardo admitted, not quite understanding the words leaving his mouth. But why? What does it mean? The antiquarian kept his gaze fixed on him, as if weighing the depth of the secret Eduardo held. To escape fate isn't always a gift. Sometimes, those who escape must pay the price they left behind. Me, Shorano die. Eduardo felt his heart race, the pressure of the environment making the air thin. He tried to argue, to say that none of this made sense, but the antiquarian's words reverberated in his mind, taking on contours of truth he didn't want to confront. Without another word, he exited the shop, feeling the old man's gaze follow him even as he stepped into the street. For the remainder of the day, Eduardo attempted to return to his routine, but everything seemed to conspire to remind him of the strange hour. The reflections in shop windows, the numbers on billboards, every display he glanced at appeared frozen at 3.15. That sense of being watched lingered, and Eduardo felt as if an invisible presence constantly stood by his side, waiting patiently. That night, as he returned home, he found the living room steeped in an icy twilight, colder than any other night. He went into the kitchen, but the air felt thin and heavy. His heart raced, 
And when he turned to the hallway, he saw the figure of the woman. She stood there, immobile, as if time around her had frozen. Her eyes were fixed on him with a hypnotic intensity, and for a moment, Eduardo couldn't look away. Please, what do you want from me? He asked, his voice trembling. The woman stepped forward, and he felt the chill intensify. Your time is running out, she said once more. But there was something different in her tone, as if every word was an inescapable sentence. Eduardo felt the ground fall away beneath him. And in a final moment of despair, he turned to flee. Yet as he took the first step, the world around him vanished, and he found himself back on that winding road. The dark environment wrapped in fog, everything was silent, and in the distance, he spotted his car parked, the figure of someone inside. He approached, intrigued and terrified at once, and realized that the figure in the driver's seat was himself. It was as if he was seeing a version of himself trapped in the car, the eyes wide open and expressionless, staring at something beyond, fixed on a blank point in the horizon. Eduardo reached out, trying to touch the glass of the window, but his fingers passed through the reflection as if he were merely a shadow. This is the moment you left behind, the woman's voice whispered, appearing at his side, a moment that should have never been forgotten. Only man kept at ease. Eduardo turned to her, desperation rising in his chest. But why? What did I do to deserve this? The woman tilted her head, her empty gaze still fixed on his. You escape time, but no one escapes without leaving a part of themselves behind. She extended the pocket watch she held, and on the face, the hands were frozen at 3.15, as if time was marked by that exact instant. Feeling a growing panic, Eduardo took a step back. This is a nightmare. It has to be, he murmured, trying to convince himself. But the woman's voice felt so real, so close, that he knew this lay beyond any dream. Now it's your turn to make a choice, she said, moving slowly closer. Accept the time you have left, or be condemned to relive every second until the end of your days. Nil mibis, bon duo. Eduardo felt the ground tremble beneath him, and in a final moment of despair, he turned to run. But as he took the first step, the world around him faded away, and he found himself back in his room. Alone, the wall clock again reading 3.15. He felt confused and exhausted, unsure if what he had just experienced was real or a hallucination created by fear. But the sense that something awaited him, somewhere between time and darkness, wouldn't vanish. Eduardo remained silent in the room, the clock still marking 3.15, the ticking of the frozen second filling the space like a dark omen. Time seemed frozen, and he felt the very air around him grow denser almost unbearable. He surveyed the room, but everything appeared still, oppressive, as if the room had transformed into a kind of invisible prison. A low, constant noise began to fill the environment, a vibration seeming to emanate from the walls themselves. Eduardo looked toward the door to the room and saw the doorknob turning slowly, the sound growing louder until the door swung open completely. In the hallway stood the figure of the woman in the white dress, awaiting him, her face illuminated by a pale, cold light. Her eyes glowed with a dark intensity, as if they had finally found what they sought. Eduardo felt his body paralyzed, but at the same time, an eerie calm enveloped him. Why are you here? What do you want from me? He asked, his voice sounding like an echo, weakened by the suffocating atmosphere. The woman stepped closer, and he could feel the temperature drop as if time itself was fading around her. You fled from a fate that could not be avoided. But now time has returned to reclaim what is its. Mm -hmm. Eduardo tried to process the words, recalling every moment he had lived since that night on the road. The sense that something had been left behind. It was as if he had crossed a boundary without realizing it, escaping an end that, in some way, was marked. But how and why? I don't understand. He whispered, his voice trembling. What does it mean to reclaim what is his? What exactly did I leave behind? The woman slowly raised her arm, and Eduardo noticed she held the same pocket watch. When she opened it, the hands did not move, stuck precisely at 3.15. 
The sight of the watch made him remember that night on the road, the accident from which he had miraculously escaped. And then, in a flash of memory, everything began to make sense. He recalled being trapped in the car, the pain from the collision feeling unbearable. At that moment, something changed, something he still couldn't fully grasp. It felt as if a part of him had been left behind that night, a part that was now returning to claim what he had failed to pay. You crossed the line between life and death. Eduardo, the woman murmured, a tone of sadness he hadn't expected. When you should have departed, you escaped. But time is patient. It always finds a way to restore balance. Now do I see. Eduardo felt a rising panic, reality fading around him as the woman's words took on contours of truth he didn't want to confront. You mean to say that I should have died that night? that my life since then has been nothing but a mistake. The woman nodded, her face maintaining the same impenetrable expression. Since that instant, your life became an echo, an existence that no longer belonged to you. But now, the time has come to reclaim the interrupted course. When I'll be you. Eduardo tried to move, but felt even more paralyzed. It was as if the walls were closing in on him the room transforming into a cage that kept him from escaping. He looked at the woman, desperation mirrored in his eyes, and finally understood time had come for him, the time he left behind, the same that continued to haunt him at 3.15, the exact hour of the accident. But what if I don't want to go? If I fight? If I try to keep living? Eduardo's voice trembled, but a thread of hope emerged as he contemplated the idea of resisting. The woman took another step closer, her face now inches from his, and Eduardo felt the weight of eternity in her empty gaze. Time is not something that can be negotiated. Your struggle only prolongs the inevitable. The more you try to escape, the more it will take from you. He soon. Her words penetrated deep into Eduardo, and he realized that in his attempt to live, he had only accumulated more emptiness. An existence without substance. Without real purpose, everything around him had always been a shadow, a pale copy of what he should have felt. Now, at last, time demanded the life he had clung to without right. The woman took one last step toward him and extended the pocket watch. Eduardo felt a crushing weakness overwhelm his body. When he grasped the watch, a barrage of images invaded him. The empty road, the accident, the moment of pain, and then the void. The life he lived until that moment unfolded before him like a long, twisted lie. The woman watched him, and he realized her face was changing, transforming into something familiar. With a chill, he recognized his own face reflected in her eyes. The woman's voice echoed one last time. Now, Eduardo, your time is up. Misenos. In a final instant, he felt himself being pulled into the watch into the moment of 3.15, where his time indeed had stopped, trapped in the same moment forever. That night, Sophia was home alone for the first time. Her parents had gone out for an important commitment, and after many pleas, she finally convinced them that she was old enough to take care of herself. The house was in absolute silence, wrapped in an unusual calm that instead of comforting her seemed to amplify every sound and shadow. Shortly after dinner, while finishing up in the kitchen, she heard a slight creak from the hallway leading to her room. She paused for a moment, her heart racing but soon calmed down, remembering what they always said. The house makes noises, it's normal. Taking a deep breath, she decided to ignore it and continued tidying up the sink, trying to distract herself. But the sound persisted, soft and almost rhythmic, like something gently scratching the wood. She decided to investigate, convinced she'd find a simple explanation, maybe the wind or the old heater. She walked down the dark hallway, the footsteps echoing on the floor, until she reached her bedroom door. She paused for a moment, 
The sound now seemed to be coming from inside her room. She slowly pushed the door open, trying not to make a noise, and took a quick glance inside. Everything seemed in place, but one detail caught her attention. The wardrobe, which she always closed before leaving, was ajar, with a slight dark gap like a cut in the silence of the night. The feeling of discomfort increased. The dark crack seemed to grow in her mind, an invitation that carried a silent warning. She approached the wardrobe cautiously, her heart pounding, and reached out to close the door. But just before she could do it, she noticed something that made her freeze. There was a light. Subtle, rhythmic breathing coming from inside the wardrobe. Sophia stepped back a few paces, her mind spinning. It's just my imagination, she whispered to herself, but the hair on her neck stood up and fear swelled like a wave. Feeling the urge to dispel the discomfort, she grabbed her phone and called her mom, trying to keep her voice calm. When her mother answered, Sophia forced a nonchalant tone. Mom, my wardrobe. It's making strange noises, she said, giving a light laugh, as if trying to joke away her own fear. Her mom chuckled softly on the other end, attributing the sounds to old wood and urging her to relax. Sophia thanked her and hung up, but the discomfort lingered. She looked back at the wardrobe. This time, she decided to close the door for good, ignoring the fear. But as she approached, she heard a low voice, an almost inaudible whisper. The voice was small, almost childlike, but laden with a strange familiarity, like a forgotten echo. Sophia, the voice called again, more urgently, as if pleading for something. Sophia stepped back, heart racing, and before she could stop herself, replied with a trembling voice, Who's there? Silence answered, deep and profound. For a moment, she felt foolish, thinking it was all a trick, but then the wardrobe door opened a bit, bit more revealing a pair of pale, large eyes fixed on her. Before she could react, the childlike voice spoke again, sad and almost pleading. The sight of the eyes paralyzed her, fear mingling with a strange sense of pity. Who, who are you? She whispered, feeling absurd for speaking to something she could hardly believe was real. The eyes shifted, disappearing into the darkness for a moment. And the voice answered, almost like a lament. I'm trapped for a long time. I can't get out. A chill ran down Sophia's spine. There was something in that voice, an ancient, desperate sadness that made her believe that somehow this wasn't just a hallucination. Gathering the little courage she had, she approached the wardrobe and slowly pulled the door open. When the bedroom light illuminated the inside, she saw a girl, pale with tangled hair and grayish skin. Wearing old-fashioned clothes that seemed yellowed by time, the figure looked at her with eyes that seemed to beg for help. Sophia stepped back, barely able to believe what she was seeing. Oh, how did you get in there? The girl lowered her head, her shoulders trembling as if about to cry. They put me here, so I wouldn't be a bother anymore. She lifted her gaze, and Sophia saw the desperation in her eyes the expression marked by a pain that seemed eternal. Who put you in there? Sophia asked, feeling a mix of compassion and fear. The ones who didn't want to see me anymore locked me here, the girl replied. Her voice choked, and Sophia realized that the girl had no shadow. It was as if she was there, but at the same time absent. An image caught between the world of the living and the dead. Sophia, filled with dread, Stepped back a few more paces, but the girl extended her hand as if pleading. Please, don't go. Don't leave me here. Nedmethion. The anguish in her voice was almost palpable. And Sophia, with a lump in her throat, hesitated. The figure continued to watch her. The eyes pleading and fixed. I just need someone to take me out of here, she whispered. Sophia, caught between compassion and fear, reached out her hand, touching the girls. But as soon as she did, an absolute emptiness enveloped her, a cold that seemed to strip every fragment of warmth from her body. She felt herself being pulled, as if the wardrobe's darkness were trying to swallow her. She tried to pull her hand back, but the girl's grip was firm, her expression now a mix of despair and determination. 
I can't get out alone, the girl said, her tone now darker. I need you to come with me. Sophia tried to pull her hand away, but the girl seemed stronger, her eyes turning empty and dark. A cold whisper filled the room, echoing like a spell. You promised me, Sophia. You can't leave now. Feeling panic take over, Sophia finally managed to free her hand, stumbling backward. In an instant, she slammed the wardrobe door shut and ran out of the room, heart racing, her face wet with tears she hadn't even realized were there. But as she reached the living room, she heard the sound of the wardrobe opening again, the low and constant creaking. The girl's whisper followed her down the hallway, carrying a haunting promise. You will come back. Sophia, I know you will. Be That night, the wardrobe remained ajar, the darkness within seeming thicker and more alive than ever, as if it waited patiently for its next chance. Sophia couldn't sleep. The image of the girl in the wardrobe was etched in her mind, her pale, pleading eyes seeming to haunt her in every corner of the house. She tried to distract herself, but the invisible presence seemed to fill the air, every shadow dancing threateningly under the weak light of the lamps. The next morning, she decided she needed answers. The wardrobe intrigued and terrified her, and Amelia's voice echoed in her mind. You will come back, Sophia. It was both a warning and a promise, and her curiosity, mixed with fear, nudged her toward investigation. After breakfast, while her parents were busy, Sophia went back to her room. She looked at the wardrobe, now closed and lifeless. The silence felt palpable. She felt a mixture of fear and determination. She couldn't let fear overtake her. She needed to understand what was happening. Sophia approached the wardrobe and, with a hesitant shove, Open the door. The inside was empty, but a chilling breeze emanated from within, as if a breath from the darkness itself was waiting for her. Heart racing, she decided to dig deeper, pulling out some clothes from inside. Among them, she found a small wooden box, dusty and covered with a torn cloth. Upon opening it, she discovered a collection of antiques, objects that seemed to belong to another time. But among them was something that made her freeze, a small diary, its pages yellowed with age. With trembling hands, she began to flip through the pages. The handwriting was elegant, but the words were filled with a growing desperation. The diary belonged to Amelia. Sophia felt her stomach churn as she read the entries. They left me here, one passage said, and I don't know how much longer I can endure. The darkness is approaching, and I can't get out. Each page revealed more about Amelia's life, her fears, and the broken promises that someone would come for her. However, the last entry paralyzed Sophia. The night the door opens, the shadow will come to find me. And then, I will finally be able to escape. No. Sophia closed the diary, her heart racing uncontrollably. It felt as if Amelia herself was speaking directly to her, revealing a dark truth that left her hands cold. What did that shadow mean? And more importantly, who would be the person to open the door to freedom? She felt a presence behind her, a wave of cold that made her turn quickly. The room was empty, but the feeling of being watched was oppressive. The shadows seemed deeper, as if they were stretching toward her. In the next moment, the wardrobe creaked, and Sophia felt that if it weren't for her curiosity, she would have likely run far away. Please, Sophia, don't run away, Amelia's voice whispered, like a distant echo seeping into her mind. It was as if the girl was close, waiting for a sign that Sophia still cared. She took a deep breath and spoke aloud. What do you want from me, Amelia? What happens if I don't help you? I am Messiah. The answer came in the form of a chilling wind that swept through the room, making the curtain sway as if something was trying to enter. You've already helped. Now you have to choose, the voice said, clearer and more urgent. Choose what? Sophia asked, feeling the adrenaline coursing through her veins. You must decide whether to stay or to leave. But know that if you leave, I will be stuck here forever, the voice whispered, filled with a weight that made her feel like crumbling. Sophia took a breath, her mind spinning. 
she didn't want to be responsible for leaving Amelia behind, but she also wasn't sure she was ready to face what that meant. The words echoed in her head like a distant bell. The shadow will come. Meh. With a newfound determination, she decided she needed to understand it all. What do I need to do to free you? She asked, her voice almost inaudible. The response was a heavy silence, but slowly. The wardrobe began to open, revealing the interior darkness once more. Fear enveloped her, but a part of her wanted to know what lay beyond that shadow. Come, Amelia said, her voice now softer, like an invitation. Come and see the truth. May. Sophia hesitated, but the sense that there was hidden power there drew her in. As she approached, the darkness seemed to call her name, and the walls of the room began to twist, as if they wanted to envelop her in their own story. Deep down, Sophia knew there was no turning back. The choice had been made, and she was about to open the door that, in some way, would lead her to Amelia. As the darkness expanded, Sophia took the final step. Her hand extended toward the wardrobe. The cold wrapped around her, and Amelia's voice echoed one last time, now louder, as if freeing something much larger than just a trapped body. The time for truth has come. Sophia, and the world around her began to spin, and with one final burst of courage, Sophia leapt into the wardrobe, seeking answers that would change everything. Time, darkness, shadow, Everything fused into a single moment of unbearable tension. And then, she vanished, carrying with her the promise that Amelia's story and hers were about to intertwine in ways no one could foresee. When Sophia crossed the wardrobe door, darkness enveloped her like a heavy cloak. She felt a piercing cold, and for a moment had the impression of floating in a timeless, formless space. There was no sound, only a deep void surrounding her as if the very air were being sucked away. Amelia's voice echoed in her head. The time for truth has come, Sophia. It is feminine. Suddenly, a soft light began to shine ahead, and as she approached, she realized she was back in Amelia's room, but everything seemed different. The walls were worn and covered with moss, and the air smelled of dampness and mildew. The girl's figure was there, more real than ever. But now, there was an aura of power surrounding her. You came, Amelia said, her voice now firmer, as if she had gained strength. You have no idea what this means. No idea. Sophia looked around, confused. What does it mean? What is happening? The tension in her body grew with every word. A mix of fear and expectation. It means you are the chosen one, Amelia replied, an intense sparkle in her eyes. Chosen to free not just me, but all who have been trapped here. You opened the door, and now you must decide. Decide what? Sophia asked, her voice trembling. The reality seemed to crumble around her. Decide whether you will help me escape or if you will remain here, part of this darkness. Amelia's voice grew more powerful, filling the space with an energy Sophia couldn't comprehend. The anguish grew within Sophia. But... What happens to you? What happens if I help? If you free me... I will be able to leave this place. But it will come at a cost. Sophia, Amelia said, her expression serious. Only a sacrifice can open the door. You must be willing to leave something behind. No, dear day, none. Sophia felt lost. Memories of the life she knew passed like a film in her mind. Her friends, her family, everything that made her feel alive. I can't do that, she said, struggling against the idea. I can't leave everything behind. Then you will be trapped, Amelia replied, her voice now darker, almost threatening. Trapped in darkness, just like me. No, me. The room began to spin again, the light flickering, and Sophia felt a rising panic. What do you want from me? She screamed desperate. What do I need to sacrifice? Someone must take your place, Amelia said, her tone now softer, almost seductive. And when the door opens, you can leave, but another must enter. Nye. Sophia looked into Amelia's eyes, searching for any truth. Who will it be? 
Doesn't matter who, just someone you love. Amelia whispered, her expression now calmer. Only then will I be free. It's the only way. Anais, a new thought struck Sophia. And if I do nothing, what if I just leave? Then the darkness will find you, Amelia replied, her voice becoming a distant echo. And you will not see the sun again. One and I are seven days. With that, the truth hit her like a punch to the stomach. There was a choice to be made, but not one she was willing to accept. The air around her grew heavy, and the room began to tremble. Sophia looked around, realizing the darkness was closing in on her, as if it were alive, forming tendrils that pulled at her. The decision had to be made. She knew she couldn't let anyone else suffer. Amelia was trapped. But that wasn't the only reality. There was a line between helping her and condemning someone else. I can't do this, Amelia! She shouted, tears streaming down her face. I can't sacrifice another life. The look on Amelia's face changed, a mix of anger and pain crossing her features. You have no choice, Sophia. Time is running out. Sophia began to back away. The wardrobe door was ajar, and the light seemed to be coming from there. Will you let me go? Will you let me out? Do you really think you can escape? Amelia's voice was now a threat. If you leave, you won't be able to escape the darkness that is approaching. It has always been here, waiting for your choice. Mioma. Tension reached its climax. Sophia turned and ran toward the wardrobe door, the desire for freedom overshadowing her fear. The darkness behind her seemed to scream, Amelia's voice echoing in her mind. You will come back. You cannot escape from me. Sophia leaped through the door, and in an instant, the world seemed to fade away. When the wardrobe light enveloped her, she felt the safety of her home, the familiar scent, but there was no space for relief. The door slammed shut behind her with a bang, and the house began to shake. She spun around, frightened, and found herself back in her room, but something was wrong. The air was heavy, the shadows denser. The wardrobe was closed, but the feeling of being watched persisted. You really thought you could escape? Amelia's voice whispered, and Sophia turned to see the figure of the girl now standing. A grim smile on her face. You made the wrong choice, and now you cannot return. Nami. Sophia realized with horror that the place was changing. The wall seemed to close in, and the daylight was fading as if the house had decided that there would be no more escape. The world was crumbling around her, and the shadows were becoming darker, deeper, while Amelia's figure watched her with a triumphant gaze. Welcome to my home, Sophia. Now, you are one of us. Lamed. And as darkness closed in, Sophia realized that by choosing to flee, she had become part of that same prison that had ensnared her. The voices echoed in the house, and the truth became clear. There was no escape. The past and present melded, and now, more than ever, she would understand what it meant to be trapped between worlds. A shadow in a wardrobe, waiting for a new story to tell.